Starting in episode 5, we get Winter's arrival and the entire scene between her, Ruby, and Weiss. This is untouched other than upping how long Winter will be in town for. Namely, she'll be there the entire night and will be leaving out the next morning, which gives us a little more wiggle room to play with her and Weiss's dynamic while still being short enough for Weiss to be disappointed. It wouldn't be a stretch to assume that Weiss wanted Winter to stay for the whole tournament. Crow arrives, fights Winter, there's a gratuitous amount of sexual tension, and Mercury records them on his phone because that's his fetish. He runs off to report this to Cinder while Ironwood arrives to call both of them out on their crap. Noticeably, this time, Winter tries to justify her attack with Crow by pointing to the broken robot, but Ironwood still scolds her because the fight endangered civilian lives. Ospin, who is with Ironwood, of course comments about the sanctioned fights happening around the figurative corner at the arena and offers to take the argument to his office to keep things private. We cut to the office with Winter and Glinda arguing over Crow's drunken behavior, and in response, Crow begins to wax philosophically over why he drinks, justifying it by accidentally letting slip details about the secret war between the Yellow Brick Bunch and their opponents. It is only after this happens that Ironwood asks Winter to leave the room, and Crow is scolded for speaking about any of those relevant details in front of someone who is very much not in the loop. Ospin and Ironwood have their argument over the overbearing presence of Atlas's military around Vale, with Ospin arguing that they should focus on choosing a new Guardian, a reference to the Fall Maiden. However, Ironwood rebukes him, saying that his forces can handle any situation, displaying his armadas throughout the room's holographic projector via his scroll. This is incidentally when his scroll gets hacked by the Queen Virus established back in Season 2. On top of that, he adds that if his fleet isn't enough, he has an emergency trump card on standby. Ospin is confused by this statement and tries to get a clear answer from Ironwood, but Ironwood walks out the door, ending the conversation outright. The last scene of the episode occurs in Cinder's room, where Emerald and Mercury have assembled. Mercury shows her the footage of Crow fighting Winter, and while she expresses some concern over Crow's presence, she ultimately waves it off. What he and his Atlas rival ended up giving them will be more than worth the extra effort of avoiding him as a precaution. The camera sticks on a still of the Crow-Winter fight footage, panning out as the episode closes. We open episode 6 with Cinder sitting at a desk, casually typing away at a desktop. She attaches the video of Crow and Winter fighting to a piece and seemingly publishes it in the Mr. Alien Times. We can see images from the Juniper vs. Auburn fight such as Arslan's crying face, and the Crow vs. Winter fight, and the title of the article seems to be something along the lines of The Vital Festival, Unifying Force, or Conflict Catalyst. Under this title, we can see that Cinder is publishing this article under the previously mentioned Ash Autumn pen name. As Cinder hits the enter on her keyboard, she smiles. We zoom in on the article and then zoom out to discover we are now viewing the article from a random civilian, who is reading it on his scroll at the festival. His brows furrow as the camera slowly pans away from him and focuses on the background, where teams Ruby and Juniper are participating in a number of game stalls while waiting for the last match of the first round to get called, which will be Coffee's first at-bat in the tournament by process of elimination. After Juniper's morning win, they're all in relatively high spirits, their mutual victories carrying them until they get to see Coffee's fight later in the day. Weiss, however, laments to Ruby and Ren that her sister has work to do while she's visiting Beacon, limiting what time they can spend together. Ruby consoles her, because Ruby is a blessed, pure soul, and Ren gives her level-headed and philosophical response that it'll make Weiss's time with her sister feel all the more rewarding. In the background, the rest of the gang are enjoying different fair games, and this is where we set up Nora failing to win a giant bear plush that will be mentioned later. I know it's not a big detail, but I like setting up the small things like that. The last activity in this section is a three-legged race where Ruby gets paired up with Pyrrha, and because of the tether, she can't fully utilize her semblance while being stuck at Pyrrha's speed. This ends with Blake and Ren winning over all of them, since they're arguably the most dexterous and coordinated of the eight. When Ruby tries to use her semblance at the end regardless to try and steal the win, she and Pyrrha fall down and have a laugh. Yang throws out a comment over how Ruby is useless without her speed, to which Ruby becomes playfully indignant. She built in the sniper function of Crescent Rose so she wouldn't be dead weight if she couldn't move. She didn't exactly take it three-legged races were going to be regular priorities for her huntsman duties. Weiss comments that Ruby wouldn't have to rely so much on her speed if she used a sword over a scythe, and Ruby comments that her uncle used a scythe and she learned everything she needed to know from him. Yang rolls her eyes and explains that he uses it to disarm his opponents and that it's typically a longsword. 
Ruby deflates, but Blake props her up by mentioning that Ruby is the only person who could use a scythe in combat, not to mention do it with such efficacy. The group is on the way to eat, preferably somewhere cheap, Ruby suggests, giving a kindly glance to Weiss, when they run into Cardin, who is getting in an argument with the guy who read the news on the scroll from the beginning of the episode. Cardin tells the guy to get the hell out of here, and the guy flees, so the two teams confront him about bullying again. Cardin defends himself, however, stating that quite ardently they only saw the tail end of the conversation. The guy was from Mistral, spouting all these ridiculous accusations about rigging in the tournament. Everyone is doubtful about that, but Ruby brings up what Velvet mentioned and begins to get concerned. Cardin actually confirms that the news sounds similar, though the slander seems to have only been exacerbated by the Juniper vs. Auburn fight and the Winter vs. Crow spat. The next match is called Team Coffee vs. Team Rando. Since it's the last one for the day and the first round of the tournament overall, the matchup and time slot were known as soon as the prior match had been randomly rolled. Cardin curses that he lost track of time and runs off. Before the rest go off to watch the match, however, Ospin appears to pull Pira away for something important. Pira tells the others to go on ahead before being taken to Ospin's office. Ruby and the rest of Juniper dash off to try and catch the match live, but only arrive in enough time to see the tail end of the round, with Fox getting the last knockout on the enemy team. It's an upset against Vacuo's fourth year team, knocking Vacuo completely out of the tournament in only the first round. Ruby and Juniper react with sympathy for Team Season and their country, though some of the Vacuo crowd members are getting angry and belligerent over the loss. Yang tells one of them to calm down and gets a bottle thrown at her, which begins to stoke her own anger. Instead of letting Yang or anyone fight, John suggests they all go congratulate Team Coffee on their victory. The more angry team members are dragged off, leaving Ruby to stare concernedly at the stadium behind her as they walk away. Episode 7 opens inside the locker rooms of the arena, with Ruby and Juniper sans Pira jogging down to congratulate Coffee on their win. As they do, they walk past a number of teams from different schools, prepping and raiding their equipment for the next round of the tournament, something that Beacon teams can do more privately as a perk of hosting the tournament this year. Coffee are cooling down after the fight and are happy to see their friends, though Fox is frustrated because one of his, uh, Tanfa things broke while performing that last KO, and the damage is pretty severe. Ruby takes a look at it and frowns, noting that it's likely repairs will take at least two days since there's a few custom parts that they'll need to scrounge up. He grimaces, noting that his spare set are older and missing some of the key upgrades he added a year prior. Which means their plan for Coco and Fox to go to the doubles round together got shot in the foot. Coco reassures him that she can take Yatsuhashi and they'll be fine, which seems to assuage him a bit. She also makes the rather pompous statement that if every fight was as easy as the last, they'll clean up the whole tournament, to which the other two teams present object quite vocally. This is when Cardin comes bursting into the room, already mid-apology about leaving his weapon behind after his match, a rehearsed statement that would have went smoothly if he wasn't seemingly caught off guard by the presence of Ruby and Juniper. He only pauses for a moment, quietly shuffling over to the locker where he'd left his mace and taking it out. As he's on his way out, he waits a moment and struggles to get out of congratulations to Velvet on her victory. She's about to spread the crate around to her team, but Cardin scuttles out the door quickly enough that she simply tails off, staring after him. Everyone is confused by what just happened, and Velvet comments that things have been weird between her and Cardin ever since the breach. Not a bad weird, just... weird. Yang does take note he's been on pretty good behavior aside from threatening a guy over the news article earlier. Coco and Velvet share a concerned look, but otherwise say nothing. When the group is leaving the lockers, they cross Neon and Flinch, readying their equipment for the next round. The two spy Weiss in the group, both getting a particularly cross expression, and Neon looks to Flint. She stands, seemingly intent on storming over to Weiss, but Flint holds her back, saying quietly it's not worth it. He glares daggers at Weiss, but turns to finish his own prep work. Weiss, feeling eyes on the back of her head, turns to look back at them, only to be met with the angry stare of Neon. Weiss bristles a little and moves towards her, only for Ruby to reach back and tug her through the door, unwittingly stopping a confrontation. Meanwhile, in Ospin's office, we finally get Pyrrha being let in on the whole maiden shenanigans by Ospin, Glinda, Crow, and Ironwood. Between this and the trip to the vault, it explained that the maidens were guardians of great magical power that protected the virtues of choice, knowledge, creation, and destruction, created by a wise wizard from a time long past. When they die, their power transfers to a new host, typically a girl the maiden was thinking of in that moment, though a random choice is made if that isn't the case. There's really not much criteria for inheriting the power past that. It has to be a girl, and most preferably one who can use the power wisely, but that's really the be-all and end-all of it. However, forces that have opposed the Maiden's purpose have sought to control them throughout history, leading to a secret society currently helmed by Ozpin to do what they can to bury the Maiden's existence. This is despite how beneficial their power could be to the world. That's just how dangerous their enemies are. The Yellow Brick Bunch explain the current Fall Maiden, Amber, has fallen after an assassination attempt, but she hasn't quite died. 
They've kept her alive as long as possible to prevent her power from going to someone unworthy as the assassins had most likely intended. To that end, Ironwood and an Atlesian Aura research team have compiled a device that can potentially transfer the aura of one person into another. However, the machine is only a prototype, and Ironwood is hesitant to test it on a live subject, insinuating he had another option available. Ospin, however, has a damn the torpedoes mentality about the transfer and wants the Fall Maiden power secured as soon as possible, choosing Pyrrha as his prime candidate thanks to her skill and temperament. He, however, recognizes that rushing Pyrrha to a decision like this would be more than stressful and offers her until the end of the Vital Festival to make up her mind whether or not she'll take up the mantle. She, of course, wants to help, despite being repulsed by the Atlesian device, but she ultimately takes Ospin up on considering the option until the end of the festival. The last shot is of Amber Stasis Pod as the light around it grows dim, leaving her silhouetted by the dull blue glow of the chamber. Then that fades away as well. Episode 8 opens on the next day with the second run of the tournament, the doubles round. In their locker room, Mercury is complaining to Cinder about having to go first, which is the next hint of the three having an idea of who's going to be chosen for each fight. Emerald and Mercury are set up against Koko and Yatsuhashi. This fight is plagued by some of the poor fight designs that plagued much of the tournament combats in Volume 3, but I'm not really keen on diving into the details of this fight, initially because doing so would eat up much more of my script, and upon further reflection, there's nothing to demonstrate with it other than the vast power differential between the two pairs, so Koko and Yatsu getting their respective rears handed to them in record time isn't going to change. The few notes I'll make are relatively minor discrepancies that would just need to be fixed in touch-up, such as Mercury throwing Yatsu over Koko instead of Koko being thrown over Yatsu, and Koko standing way closer to the forest when Emerald draws her in so we don't get the impression a mile-long chain can condense down into Emerald's weapon. Also, as with every fight in this volume, sheer down all the frickin' reaction takes dramatically. We don't need those to get that the characters are surprised. Regardless, Emerald and Mercury win and Team Coffee are knocked out of the tournament. Afterwards, we catch up with Weiss and Winter conversing over tea. Winter elaborates that she is departing Vale later that day, revealing that she was only there to accompany a delivery of Atlesian Paladin mech units. She throws a bitter comment out about Weiss getting wrapped up with the stolen prototypes, noting if they hadn't been prototypes, Team Ruby would have been in far more trouble. Weiss is about to defend her and her team when Winter's tone softens and she remarks that it's still an incredible feat, and by the sounds of it, her and her team did an incredible job in a terrible circumstance. This praise leaves Weiss fighting an absolutely ecstatic smile off of her face. Winter reminisces about the day that Weiss left home and how their father was so adamant she go to Beacon over Atlas so that she wouldn't get conscripted, a fact that was touched upon in the last season. Winter was of course sad to see her sister go, but she shows a spark of pride in the young woman that her sister is shaping into. The topic eventually changes to center around Weiss's progress with her semblance, Glyphs, which has a rare trait that passes the same semblance down a genetic line. Weiss boasts that she's made significant progress, but that she's failed to master the most powerful aspect of her family's shared semblance, summoning. Winter, instead of demonstrating it and showing off to the viewer and by proxy rubbing it in Weiss's face that she can't summon yet, offers what little time they have left together to help her find where Weiss might be having her roadblocks. In the Ruby dorm, Crow, Yang, and Ruby are enjoying some bonding time when their exploits during the semester come up as a subject of conversation. Crow warns them away from the vigilante stunts they've been pulling, and even notes his suspicions over how sharply violence and crime have dived since Torchwick's arrests. He's worried that Ruby and Yang will be caught up in something they won't be able to escape from, citing that Team Stark got themselves into plenty of messes that they never quite fully recovered from. Ruby and Yang fawn over his concerns, but assert their self-assurance that they can make it through anything if they stick together. Crow laughs at them and ruffles their hair, telling them that they can't say something that cockily until they've become true huntresses. Back with Winter and Weiss, the two are in the middle of a training session, with the two mirroring each other's form almost perfectly. It's here that Winter notes that Weiss's finesse isn't to blame for her failure to summon, and instead it could be coming from something of a mental block instead. Weiss asks what could be wrong, and Winter explains that since summons originate from felled foes, they are to some degree sentient and can choose when to appear. Because of their link with the summoner, it's possible they're not deeming Weiss worthy of their time. Weiss asks how to appease the summons if that's the case, to which Winter doesn't know. Her first summon came to her naturally with no problems. Weiss is disheartened, and Winter tries to cheer her up by promising that it's not something that Booksmarts can really teach, that she needs to feel it out, and Weiss quips that it's not really her strong suit. Winter chuckles back that she knows, because if Weiss were able to feel out a situation properly, she'd understand why her credit card got shut down. 
Weiss blanches at this, and Winter explains that their father is willing to turn the card back on if Weiss would just share a call with him. She understands Weiss's rebellious nature, but she also knows that sometimes you have to appease your enemy to pull yourself into a more advantageous position. She encourages Weiss to just bite the bullet and take the next call, and the two begin to head out. As they part ways, neither of them are aware that Weiss summoned a small white sword in her last attempt. Weiss watches her sister's airship leave and receives another call from her father, though only hesitating a moment before rejecting it once more. The last scene of the episode opens in the dorms with Emerald, Mercury, and Cinder. Emerald argues that the Team Funky duo should face Yang and Weiss from Ruby because of their personal grievances between Flint and Weiss, justifying her argument by pointing out Flint's family being incredibly vocal opponents to the Schnees and their business practices. Cinders considers it while flipping through a series of files on her scroll stolen from Ironwood during his argument with Ozpin back in Episode 3. Just as she agrees to set up the fight, she discovers something else among the information. She smiles as we can clearly see Penny's structural designs and states that the tournament just got a whole lot more interesting. Thank you for watching Section 2 of Fixing Ruby Part 5. As with my previous Fixing installments, I'll be responding to your thoughts and questions as you leave them in the comments down below, so long as they're said in a calm and genial manner. I love to hear your guys' thoughts, and honestly, I can't wait to hear what they are for this particular video series. I'm very proud of what I've done here. A friendly reminder that I could not do this without the support of every single one of my lovely patrons. Remember that for one dollar or more, you too could get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server where I, Fatman Falling, Tom Haran, and Sixlet Productions, and British Ninja are regularly active. And if you feel like you don't want to spend a dime supporting this channel, please feel free to subscribe, click that bell, and make sure your alerts on YouTube are active. As well as share this video around to anyone you think might be interested in this type of content. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll catch you all in the next installment.